and then he informed him that his perception is the incident was totally his perception of the incident was totally different from the Taoists, and he related what he'd seen. The reason the snake came out of your head is probably because you have such a big temper and are always getting angry. If you don't change your fiery nature, you're likely to become a snake. Snakes have poison in their hearts, and your hatred is just like a poison in you right now. The monk continued. You went outside and drank a lot of liquid from a cesspool filled with urine and excrement. That is your heavenly pool with sweet dew water. And when I put a blade of grass and a lump of salt in your path, you thought it was an immortal spirit out to get you. That's when you hurried back and re-entered your head. That's what I saw. The old Taoist thought, then everything I have cultivated is totally wrong. So he bowed to the monk as his teacher and followed him to cultivate the Buddha Dharma. He gave up indulging in his formal skills. So if people tell you they can leave their body during their dreams, it is a yin spirit they are referring to. This yin spirit will mirror your own disposition. If you are a compassionate person, it will be a compassionate spirit. If you are an angry person or a greedy person, it will be like that. That's why it said a pupil with a single thought of hatred, 80,000 obstacles arise. The old Taoist had such a temper that he could transform into a snake. Thank goodness he met a monk who saved him and kept him from having to become a snake in some other life. Sutra Suddenly he awakens and immediately recognizes the sound of pounding. He tells the members of his household, I was just having a dream in which I mistook the sound of pounding for the sound of a drum. Commentary Suddenly the person in the deep sleep who is dreaming awakens. He comes out of his sound sleep probably because the sound of the rice being pounded is so loud and because the sound of the cloth being beaten is also noisy. He comes out of his dream and immediately recognizes the sound of pounding. Very quickly, he recognizes the sound of rice being pounded and knows it is not a bell being rung. There are many methods used to pound rice. Sometimes it is done with water power, sometimes with manpower. In the past, I mend the pastor to a sing monastery at Daoyu Mountain, but usually I would pound only for a little while before someone came along to relieve me. The Da Chao Monastery in Yunmen, established by the elder master Su Yun, the rice was pounded by water power, which was very convenient. When this person wakes up, he knows that the sound he's heard is a sound of pounding rice. He tells the members of his household, I was just having a dream in which I mistook the sound of pounding for the sound of a drum. When I was asleep, I was dreaming and my perceptions went awry. I thought the sound of the rice being pounded was actually a drum being beaten. The text above mentions the sound of a bell as well as the sound of a drum, but the principle is the same. The drum can represent the bell and vice versa. It's not important. In lecturing sutras, you have to be flexible when explaining the text. Don't be too exacting. In lecturing, you want to explain the principle. If you make the principle clear, slight variations in the text are of no great importance. Sutra Ananda, how can this person in the dream state remember stillness and motion, opening and closing and penetrability and obstruction? Yet, although he is physically asleep, his hearing nature is not drowsy. Commentary Ananda, do you understand now or don't you? How can this person in the dream state, I don't know who the person in the dream state is, Is it me, is it you, or is it someone else? 
How can it remember stillness and motion? How can it remember stillness and movement? So he's in his dream. How does he still recollect opening and closing and penetrability and obstruction? He doesn't have this kind of discriminating mind in his dream state. He doesn't make distinctions between stillness and movement or between what is open and penetrable and what is closed and obstructed. Yet, although he is physically asleep, his body is sleeping. His hearing nature is not drowsy. His hearing nature isn't dozing. He has not been severed from him. It has not uh, severed from him. Even in sleep, his hearing nature remains. If it's still there, then why did he make uh, he why did he mistake the sound of beating gloves and pounding rice for a drum being played or a bell being rung? In his waking state, he is familiar with the sounds of a drum, drum and bell, and so in sleep, these sounds manifest in his eight consciousness and lead him to believe he is hearing a drum or bell. He makes a mistake in perception. All the upside down things that people involve themselves are in are like the mistaken interpretations of sounds in a dream. The mistake brings about upside down thinking, just like the old Taoist. He thought he was going to the heavens and drinking sweet dew when, in fact, he's drinking urine from a cesspool. If he'd realized the truth, he'd have vomited for sure. But at the time, he didn't know what he was doing. He was like a dog eating his excrement. He took the whole thing for granted, and even though he was really in a good place, he felt like he was being treated to something special, all because he failed to recognize what was really happening. Sutra, even when your body is gone and your light and life move on, how could this nature leave you? Commentary The above section of test explains that your hearing nature does not sleep even when your body is asleep. Even in dreams, the hearing nature is not cut off. It is eternal. Not only is it not severed in the dream state, it is not cut off at death either. Thus, the text now says, even when your body is gone, when you die and your body is gone, and your light and life move on. When your life is cut off, it's not that it's actually cut off. Rather, when a person dies, his life moves on. It's just like a person who lives in a hotel. He will move to a new hotel when the old one gets to run down. So, when you've cast off this shell, when you have finished with this body, you will move somewhere else. How could this nature, the hearing nature, leave you? How could it disappear when your physical form, uh, physical form disappears? Even at death, this nature is not cut off. Sutra, but because living beings from time without beginning have pursued forms and sounds and have followed their thoughts as they run and flow, they still are not aware that their nature is pure, wondrous, and everlasting. Commentary When you reach the end of your physical existence, when your body decays and dies, your light and life will move on. But your nature, your hearing nature, is indestructible. But because living beings from time without beginning have pursued forms and sounds, why don't living beings become Buddhas? Why don't they come to understand the way? It is because they have pursued forms and sounds from limitless, limitless compass passed right down to the present. They chose the defining objects of forms and sounds and get involved with them. They have followed their thoughts as they turn and flow over and over and they still are not aware. They mistake the forms for the true and are turned around by this mundane dust. They are so involved with what is false that they fail to recognize what is true, and so now they are still not aware that their nature is pure, wondrous, and everlasting. They don't understand this doctrine, 
which is subtle, wonderful, and truly permanent. Sutra, they do not accord with what is eternal, but choice after things which are subject to production and extinction. Because of this, they are born again and again and become mixed with defilement as they flow and turn. Commentary, they do not accord with what is eternal. They do not pursue the principle of the wonder and permanence of their own nature. What is more, they go in counter to this principle and they trace after things which are subject to production and extinction. Is there anything in this world which is not subject to production and extinction? Everything with form and appearance is a drama of production and extinction. The drama of non-production and non-existent Non-extinction has no form or appearance, but most people become attached to things with form and appearance and forget about the principle of wonderful permanence. Because of this, they are born again and again. This life is followed by the next life, and the next life turns into the one after that. What happens life after life, beings have to become mixed with defilement as they flow and turn, the word mixture implies that one does not maintain purity but is stained by defilement, which further pollutes the mixture. What does one get mixed up with? With the turning and flowing. And what is meant by turning and flowing? In this life, one is named Smith, and in the next life, one is called Jones. In the following lifetime, one is called Cow. In the one after that one is named horse and in the one that follows one is called a pig you shouldn't think that things are always going to be like they are right now the old pig was a former old man joe's the elder joe's is just the present old cow one person just keeps turning around and around it is the same nature with a different body, and because that's the way it goes, you fail to understand. You don't recognize what's going on. Although you don't recognize what's going on, I do. I recognize that you are old cow, old horse, and old pig. When you act like a horse, you turn into a horse. When you act like a pig, you turn into a pig. When you act like a dog, you become a dog. When you act like a cow, you turn into a cow. And if pig is capable of human behavior, if it does something meritorious, it can become a person. One turns and flows in the paths of rebirth. Sometimes one is born in the heavens, but once the heavenly blessings are used up, one falls into the hells again. When the sufferings of the hells have been endured, one gets born in the human realm or becomes an animal. If a person is very uncouth and has no understanding of human behavior, there's no need to wonder about it. In his last life, he was certainly an animal. If he hadn't been an animal in his last life, he wouldn't be so rude in this life. But even though you understand that he was an animal before, you should not slight him by saying something like, you last life, you were a pig for sure, or you must have been a cow before, even if he was a pig or a cow, all living beings have the Buddha nature and all can become Buddhas. He may be stupid now and not know that he should cultivate, but if, on the other hand, he were to become vigorous, he might become a Buddha before you do. There's nothing fixed about it. Even if he is an animal, you should not look down on him. In a former life, the Buddha was never slighting Bodhisattva, who always said, I don't dare slight any of you. In the future, you will all become Buddhas, or includes all living beings. People who have not obtained the Buddha eye and the wisdom eye should not slight living beings. People who have obtained the Buddha eye should even less slight living beings. All living beings are your past fathers and mothers and are future Buddhas. How many parents have we had in the past through life after life? It's not known how many there have been. Because of this, the Ulumbana Assembly celebrated every year on the 15th day of the 7th lunar month is an excellent opportunity to save a lot of people. 
in celebrating it, we set up memorial blocks so that our ancestors, the ghosts, uh, can stay here and listen to the sutras. After they've heard the sutra, they can go to rebirth and at the very least, they will become influential people in who in the future will protect and uphold the Buddha Dharma Sutra. But if they reject production and extinction and uphold eternal truth, an everlasting light will appear and with that the sense organs, defiling objects and consciousnesses will disappear. Commentary, but if they reject production and extinction, if in cultivating the way you don't make use of your conscious mind, that makes discriminations, and if you uphold eternal truth, if you use your true and natural, wonderfully eternal mind, your true mind and eternal nature, then an everlasting light will appear. Eventually, you will produce a constant light, the light of your self-nature, and with that, the sense organs, defiling objects, and consciousnesses will disappear. Your thoughts involving the six sense organs, the six sense objects, and the six consciousnesses will disappear at the same time. Sutra, the appearance of thought, becomes defilement. The emotions of the consciousness become filth. If you stay far away from this too, then your Dharma eye will accordingly become pure and bright. How could you fail to accomplish unsurpassed knowledge and enlightenment? Commentary The appearance of thought appearance refers to one of the two aspects of the eighth consciousness, the aspect of appearance, which means all external conditioned dramas. Thought refers to your false thinking. False thinking and the aspect of appearance combine to form defilement, literally dust. The emotions of the consciousness become filth. This refers to attachment to the second aspect of the eighth consciousness, the aspect of seeing, which means internal perceptions. In your discriminating mind consciousness, you produce emotions and with them comes defilement. The origin of filth is emotions. What harms people most is their emotions. No matter what situation they encounter, they react with emotion. The problem of emotion causes people to be born in a swoon, a swoon and die in a dream. If you stay far away from these two, the appearance of thought which brings defilement and the emotions of consciousness which make filth you want to separate from both aspects of the eighth consciousness, appearances and seeing, and if you can be apart from thoughts and emotions, then your Dharma eye will accordingly become pure and bright. The Dharma eye referred to here is not necessarily the Dharma eye that is one of the five eyes and six spiritual penetrations. It can be interpreted to figuratively mean the opening of your wisdom. It's even more wonderful if you actually open your Dharma eye so that throughout the ten directions and the three periods of time to the ends of empty space and the Dharma realm, everything is a Dharma treasury. If your Dharma eye is clear and pure, you immediately stop being muddled. In your mind, there is genuine wisdom. How could you fail to accomplish unsurpassed knowledge and enlightenment? How could you not obtain unsurpassed wisdom and enlightenment? You will certainly obtain it. Just stay away from the dust of false thought and the defilement of emotion. This is just a short passage of Sutra text, but everyone should pay particular attention to it. Don't get attached to emotion and love and become involved in discriminations and false thinking. You want to separate yourself from them. Did you hear? This is very important. Don't take it lightly. Don't fall asleep now. If you fall asleep and fail to study this sutra, you've truly missed an opportunity. Everyone should write this passage in his or her mind and never forget it. The appearance of thought becomes refinement. The emotions of the consciousness become filth. If you stay far away from this too, then your Dharma eye will accordingly become pure and bright. How could you fail to accomplish unsurpassed knowledge and enlightenment? 
Not only should you memorize the Sura Gamma Mantra, you should memorize the Sutra text as well. Every day, your responsibilities become greater. I'm not here just to play with you. I'm not just joking with you. You can't be the least bit sloppy.